All right. Hey, everyone. This is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. Today, I'm joined by James Levitch. He's a reformed hedge fund manager with over 25 years of institutional investing and risk management experience, having worked for investment banks and hedge funds. Currently, he's the managing partner at the uh, Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, a hybrid hedge fund that makes uh, investments in companies and assets in the Bitcoin ecosystem. He also teaches financial fundamentals and the benefits of Bitcoin through his newsletter called The Informationist and as a co-founder of the educa educational platform Looking Glass Education. As someone without a background in economics and finance, your content has helped me a lot in learning about these topics as they are pivotal to understanding the potential of Bitcoin. So I'm super excited to to talk to you. Welcome, James. Thanks for, for coming on. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Bitcoin, right? So thank <laughs> yeah. you for having me, first of all. I, I, I sincerely appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, my work and others' work has, has helped uh, you on the learning path. That, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I, I think... In in the past, I've also made like digital products that I launched and 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 saw how it reached people like all over the world, right? So I think like the magic of the internet is just really cool, right? Like when yeah. you spend your own time and try to help or educate other people, like you never know how far it travels. So I know the feeling, but I still wanted to <laughs> give it, wanted all to true. give you props for uh, Thank you. for 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 teaching me so much. Like uh, as we just talked before before I hit record, like. You said welcome to yeah. Yeah, you said welcome to Bitcoin. Like the the topics of <laughs> global macro, understanding finance, economics, investing, like those are eventually touch points and elements, you know, that that you run into. And as someone like me without a background in this, I think I actually avoided it for a long time. <laughs> but like the yeah. last two, three years, <clears throat> you know, especially after uh COVID and stuff like yeah. It just really got on my radar. And um, I think in general, like when people talk about this a lot, a, a lot of the people obviously talk about uh, the US, right? Because it's the still the quote unquote best currency in the world. But it's actually not really going so great, right? And, and also the, the problems in the US will affect other countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no question about it. The thing is, is... Uh, and look, I, I say reformed hedge fund manager because I, I I was used to that system, have been used to the system that has benefited some uh, a small portion of people greatly over the years, and yeah, um, and so when I came to Bitcoin in particular, it, it it helped me realize just how just how deeply flawed and broken the system really is, and mm. how. Um, the you know just the way that we have central banks manipulate the currency continuously it's problematic and greatly problematic for for people who don't own assets and so um understanding why the money is broken is it, it it's essential to understanding bitcoin there's just no there's just no way other way to put it yeah, uh, Bitcoin isn't just something you want to trade and make money off of, like a, you know, uh, like a meme stock or uh, one of the other uh, cryptocurrencies. It, this is actually something that is important. Um, re it's incredibly important for people who are, especially outside the U.S., who are in countries that are uh, that are bearing the burden of of their own central banks making massive. Um, mistakes and decisions that hurt them uh, really been hurting them these last number of years, places like Lebanon and Venezuela and Argentina, the, these, the, the citizens have been hurting and Bitcoin is a, is a way out for them. And that's why it's so important to, to me and other people who have been kind of trying to educate others about why the money is broken here. Yeah. But, people there already know it. They understand the money's broken and yeah. they're looking for something else. So, Yeah, very interesting. Like, uh, first of all, I know you know uh, Greg Foss as well, right? You, you work Do together. You? It's also a big inspiration for me. But what I love that has also helped me in my own kind of like, uh, you know, the humility that you come across when you learn about Bitcoin is that uh, people like Greg and also like you, you know, you spent uh, over two decades in 
in the, in the financial system that you actually were able to you know turn your view around in a sense right you know mm. I, I don't i don't think that's that's easy and it's well especially when you thought you understood something and and were doing something um well positively you know like it's interesting that that you like see the other side and so i can also imagine i've uh, talked a lot of, in this podcast about like the teaching you or well studying bitcoin takes a long time <laughs> it takes it uh it's it's still taking me time even after 10 years i'm learning every day right but um i think it's very admirable when you're a bit older and you have a long um like career in in tradfi that that you were able to like turn this around like what was that turning point for you like what yeah, was your I mean, starting starting point let's there? be honest it was not easy uh yeah. i had i had heard about bitcoin years and years before uh in fact my wife had been listening to a podcast uh i think it was tim ferris or something they were talking about bitcoin i can't remember it was it was it was early it was 2015 or 2017 it was in those years mm. i read um, you dismissed it right <laughs> and i dismissed it i just yeah. kept, and, and it, there wasn't that uh, i Look, I, I deeply respect my wife. It wasn't that. It was just I, I thought, yeah, you know, podcasts are talking about some, you know, <laughs> fly by night, get rich quick thing. I'm just no, I, I'm, I'll take care of the finances, you know. And uh, mm. she's she's very smart. She's a she's an author. She's a New York Times bestselling author. She's not a dumb oh. person. So, <laughs> but I'm like, I'll just take I'll take care of the finances. Don't worry about it. And stupidly, I dismissed it. And then. Uh, you know, a couple of years later, uh, I was flash forward to uh, 2019 ish uh, and uh, or 20. Actually, it was it was a couple of years. It was about 2017. And I'm looking at Bitcoin thinking I, there was I wanted to get out on the risk curve a little bit and, and invest in something that was a little bit riskier than the things that I had been doing normally in, in the hedge fund private mm -hmm. equity world. And so I I did my research on it by talking to the experts in my industry, you know, the, the technology experts and analysts and portfolio managers, and they all dismissed it. So it's, it's a Ponzi scheme. It's worth nothing. <laughs> you know, you're going to lose all your money. Uh, there's no underlying value. And I mean, everybody, every single professional I spoke to said the same thing. And one of them said, I've got some, but I had to buy it for the briefcase of money. And, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> I, he's like, it's it's worth nothing. I don't, whatever. So I ignored it, and uh, it's it's been the the greatest uh, financial mistake of my life. I mean, I've invested things and lost all my money, and this is e even bigger mistake because this is something that if I had done what I was considering doing back then, uh, it had been life changing. But you know, uh, you, we 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 get uh, the price of Bitcoin that you deserve, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it took me it humbles you from the start <laughs> almost it does, it does. Yeah, and yeah. so but what i didn't understand about it is and no none of them did is how it's not just i mean at that time bram i didn't know the difference between bitcoin bitcoin cash ethereum mm -hmm. i didn't know that these things were all different i was just like well, they're all cryptocurrencies what's the difference yeah. bitcoin's the oldest that's what i always heard but we still hear that we still hear that from people that, oh, it's just Bitcoin's the oldest. It's the biggest. Mm. It's the most boring because you're not going to get a thousand X on it. But if I buy this other coin, maybe I'll get a thousand X on it. So there's still a, quite a bit of, of understanding that to be had out there, especially in developed areas like in Europe and in, in uh, United States and Australia, um, because they're citizens that are in a system that has worked well enough for them you know, yes they're they're the, the guise of of the system working for them is uh it, it it's it's thick enough that they don't see behind mm. the veil to see exactly what's going on um so but anyways i did come around to it and uh, I got it again into it very late. Uh, I got into it around the same time as Michael Saylor, maybe a few months after him. So uh, that's when I really dug in, listened to him, listened to others. And the breaking point for me, and I had been so when we got when we got locked down in the in the in COVID, I was uh, I I was leaving my job 
because mm-hmm. my job was in Dallas and I, and I had moved out to be with my wife, um, out in uh, Nevada. And so, uh, I was leaving and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And my son who's in college, he was like, Hey dad, I think you ought to give this cryptocurrency another look. Cause we had talked about it before. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I dug in and started buying some things and bought some Ethereum and Cardano and, you know, and Bitcoin. And then as I was doing my research, I quickly learned that, oh, I, I need to move everything into Bitcoin and get out of, get what out was of that. Stuff. What was that? The, yeah. What was that? That, that realization? That moment? Yeah. Um, like, how did you get there? I got there when I understood, when I, when I first understood, okay, that Bitcoin is completely decentralized and it wasn't controlled by one party. Once I understood that, then I moved all my uh, investments <laughs> in, in cryptocurrency yeah. into Bitcoin. I was like, I don't want one person to be able mm. to do, you know, it's bad enough if you have a board of directors. Yeah. So, uh, so I did that. And then as I was digging in deeper, and this is what we, this is what we do uh, in Wall Street, you call legging into a trade. I just, you buy a little bit and it forces you to go do some research, really mm-hmm. do research in order to build on that position. That's basically what I was doing. And so as I was building that position, uh, there, was a, there was a great uh, discussion between Jeff Booth and Pomp. And he was explaining to Pomp that the, the, he was walking Pomp through his book, basically. Je- mm-hmm. So Jeff Booth had, uh, wrote that book, uh, The Price of Tomorrow. Fantastic book. And, uh, and it, what it does, it's not about Bitcoin. It's about <laughs> yeah. it's about the broken market forces of mm-hmm. inflation versus deflation, how technology should be deflationary and we should be getting the benefit of advances of technology where, you know, a, where you can have your iPhone now or you can take thousands and thousands of photos and not have to have them developed or send them off and buy the paper. And, you know, they're right there. You can have them up on your computer in an, in an instant. Uh, that's, that's the advancement of technology. It takes the price of photography down to basically zero. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's the same thing with music. You're paying pennies on the dollar for when I was a kid before you were even born, bro, I was, we would have to buy CDs and we would have to buy cassette tapes of mm-hmm. music and it would cost, it would cost 14, $15 back then, which is a lot of money back then. Uh, Great Just business for, model also for yeah, nine, nine to 12 yeah. songs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Was yeah. Great. yeah. So, uh, and then if you want to tape, you would make mixtapes and spread them around. It was kind of like bootlegging them. And that mm-hmm. was, and that was I did that in high school. technically, <laughs> but yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that's what we, but th- that's the thing is that he, I was listening to that conversation and he was talking about those forces colliding mm-hmm. and, and how that inflationary force of the central banks versus the deflationary forces of technology and how they're colliding. And, yeah. uh, and that's where we're at right now. And that's why you see these central banks struggling. And we're, we're just, we're taking on more and more debt where we are uh, printing more and more money because we have to absolutely must have inflation yeah. in order to manage that and and when he when he walked through that i finally just like that was it then i really that took me over the the hump and i was like okay i'm all in i understand it i get it i understand why this is so important now and that's when i turned my attention yeah <clears throat> nice i uh yeah two things i would love to talk about the depth spiral with you but before i think yeah. the cds are actually a great example right <laughs> because Actually, what you're saying is like true, and, and also what Jeff is saying in the book, right? Book, right? Like true, the advancement of technology, current players in a market who chose another technology that was best at time, another time, right? To to run their business, so they chose the mm-hmm. the CDs, right? True, digital technology in phones and MP3s and whatever, you know, there the competition started to arise for the CDs, right? And they fought a long time <laughs> about it. A long time. Uh, yeah. You know, if you, if you look at the, what is it, the Spotify documentary or the Pirate Bay documentary mm-hmm. and all that stuff like that. So, and Netflix, the same stuff, yeah. <clears throat> same stuff, actually, yeah. Well, they solved their own uh, struggle, right, by going right. digital. But, but what is actually 
proposed here is right like through the advancement of technology you you are automatically challenged as a player in whatever market right to adapt to mm -hmm. that technology but when you say like the central bank is is battling the advancement that technology brings is basically they're trying to stall it or something b before the technology makes them obsolete uh, or absolutely. exposes their their scheme basically yeah or it, yeah it's 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 extraordinarily disruptive mm -hmm. these types of advancements in technology and so when when and that was what it came down to is i understood that wow bitcoin is really disruptive it, it's disruptive of a, as a base layer it's disruptive from all the way from individual transactions up to banks up to uh central banks and it disrupts the entire business model and that's the and that's really the crux of it and uh but understanding that and understanding how integrated that all is and why it's so different this is why when you know when i talk to somebody and they ask me what i do and i tell them i'm a, I'm a hedge fund manager I've, I've got a bitcoin opportunity fund uh, and i educate people on finance well they they ask about bitcoin they're like yeah this bitcoin thing so is that you do you expect it to really um you expect to really make a lot of money out of that and uh, and my answer is always well yes i do expect that it will that people will make fortunes with it but not just off the bitcoin price mm. it's because not of in the dollars it, maybe right right a lot of value it, but that's a good point mm -hmm. yeah exactly and so and the and my and i and i walk through how the money is really broken and why it's so important and then it begins to click but there's there's a tremendous amount of resistance of of mental and emotional resistance mm -hmm. to that truth from yeah. and so especially from my from my old industry from the yeah. traditional banking traditional investment world there is a tremendous amount of resistance to that because they just can't wrap their heads around how the system could be broken when it's benefited them so greatly to now it has done it, it, they've done so well with this system why would they want it to change that's why you hear people like Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett and even Elizabeth Warren Krugman or is that Krugman yeah Krugman yeah. well he's a yeah he's a yeah he's a, a well a still mouthpiece <laughs> yeah. for the yeah the White House but and that's yeah. right and that's and that's the point is that they they're they they've benefited tremendously from this system I mean even even Fed governors say it even Fed presidents say it like um Mary Daly said well I don't feel inflation it doesn't touch me because I have enough money and that's one of our that's Wild. that's one of the people who is <laughs> yeah. who's, who's deciding policy for this nation. Yeah, and arguably for, for a lot of the world. I mean, that's just it makes you realize that there's there's a there's a there's a club, and as close as you you can get to it, you're 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 really not in it. Mm. And so, um, and that's why they're fighting it. They're fighting it because. They know how disruptive it is. So that your point of CDs versus cassette tapes versus and then Spotify versus CDs, Spotify versus CDs and Apple Music and all that, that was so tremendously disruptive. It, it, and, and you can see how those industries, the, there, there are certain areas, the middlemen collapsed out of that. Yeah. Right. And so that's the that's the point is that the middlemen collapse out. But do you think it's and do you think it's harder for this topic because money is like what makes the world go around and the technology that we use to to exchange information and value with each other? Like, is this the the biggest fight in a sense that could be picked by by technology then? I, I would I would say yes because there's no there's there's no hiding from it. That's a good point, and so, and it's a very intimate thing, right? Money is a very intimate thing. We don't talk about how much we make with each other. It's just mm. you know, often parents don't even tell their kids how much they make, and so um, it's almost taboo. You don't talk about it, but you deal with it. And the crazy thing is, is that you make money. And if you're lucky enough, if you're fortunate enough to make enough that you can, that you have some left over, you can't just put that in the bank and let it sit there 
and wait for you to decide when you want to use it. You can't just accumulate it. If you can every minute that it sits there, it is getting eaten away by inflation. And so the system forces you to take risk Mm -hmm. in order to keep what you have built. So by taking risk, by the way, by taking risk. Exactly. So imagine that you, you build a house and Every day, it, the weather eats it away every single day, every single day, unless you do things that, that shore it up and you, you, know, you, you have to protect it. But the difference is here, you, it's not that you're, just, you're spending, you're, you literally have to take risk in the market in order to protect what you've created. Yes. And for the first time in history, that's not the case because you have something that that can't that 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 is anti-inflationary. And so when when I explain it to people that way, the difficult part though is Brahma is they don't they people typically have a very they have a very difficult time making that mental leap of this is actually this this is not just a tulip. It it's it's not something that is uh you know um it's not just a, a fad it, it it's not just the the next thing that is going to that's going to collapse and so um uh, the trust is a difficult thing to get over especially as they turn on the tv and every single day they see they see people saying oh it's going to zero oh these people are crazy they're going to lose all their money and and the fear mongering is the hard part to get over often. Yeah, yeah. Lots of things I would love to touch upon, like what <laughs> what you said. They turn on the TV and they see everything is a okay. You know, no, <laughs> go back to right. go back to go back to sleep. It's all well. Um, but I wanted to touch upon what you said about you know your 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 generational peers and also career peers. Like they have a hard time because they build a career in in a system that's basically broken they are were lucky enough to benefit from it right what, what how made how did that make you feel like what was your fight there in a sense it's the same thing I, I i didn't i didn't believe in it i didn't believe it was real i mm. didn't believe there was actually anything to it i i thought it's a speculative asset just like a just like tulips were you know um and i thought or beanie babies or whatever. And I thought, there's nothing to this. So what if it's digital? It's just a bunch of, you know, um, computer nerds that are trading around this this so-called coin. They're probably using it in games. And of course, at the time, it was all over the news about it being used for illicit activity, for smuggling, for human smuggling, for drug smuggling. For And so I thought, Oh, uh, that's not something I want to get mixed up in, mm. and it's not really. It, it it's just a fad. It's going to fade because it, I I couldn't believe that it was real. Yeah. Now every single day, that it doesn't have to go from here to a hundred thousand this year. Every single day that Bitcoin is here, and there and it's talked about, it solidifies its place in the in the choices of assets around the world because I can use it. You can use it. Someone down in Argentina can use it. We could, we could send, I could send you some Bitcoin. You could send it to somebody in Lebanon who sends it to somebody in Argentina, send it to somebody in Venezuela who sends it to somebody in Japan. All within, you know, if we do it block to block within an hour, which is just crazy mm. to think about. Try doing that with a bank, right? So, and or gold, <laughs> or gold. Yeah. You can't do yeah. it. You can't I love do how, it. I love how when when you start to talk about Bitcoin, you already oh, we're talking for twenty minutes. Like you, you touch upon so many different subjects, right? And that's also why, or, or like uh, how I said, like the dimensions basically of Bitcoin, right? Like it's technology, it's finance, it's economics, it's personal development in a sense, right? Uh, yeah. I find it super interesting that there's that, that Bitcoin is n- not about intelligence, right? I think it's more about... Uh, I'm not the smartest <laughs> one. <laughs> well, no, me neither, definitely not. But I think it's more about like some sort of intellectual curiosity and, and honesty in a sense, right? That also that you, that you now can recognize that you were 
mm-hmm. perhaps a bit dishonest, right? Because of your ego at a certain moment. But then later on, you realize, oh, yeah, that was the journey that I uh, I went through. No That's also, yeah. yeah, Bitcoin is just, it, it, it's, it, it takes time to understand and it's hard. And I, I, I think it's great where you start with, you know, the money is broken. I love, I, I also really follow this analogy of, you know, you take risk with a job or a venture to, er, to, to, to do, to give to away protect. physical energy and mental energy. Yeah. Yeah. And you earn energy in return. Yes. That's what we call money now. Yeah. Right. And if you don't want to buy anything right now or spend it on something, or maybe you want to save for your kid and you would expect in a logical world, <laughs> maybe, you know, that, that same, en- that, that energy would be the, worth the same when your kid goes to college. But when right. you're actually part of a system that purposefully debases that energy, then you are also kind of, yeah, intruded in your freedom in a sense because you have to go out there and mitigate, well, 2% on paper, <laughs> the risk, right? Yeah, and that's, a point. And, and that's yeah. another point. Yeah, that's another point. It, 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 absolutely, that's right. So you, you expend that energy to then uh, create enough that you have an abundance of it, store some of it to keep yes. for later use or for your children or whatever. And uh, yeah, and that's exactly right. And so. Um, but the, the, and that, and that's the thing about, about Bitcoin is that when people start to understand that, look, it's not about, uh, I mean, we could easily make it about number go up technology because it's, it, it's, it's up over a hundred percent, you know, um, it, this year it's, uh, it, it's up thousands of percent over the course of a few years. Like it, it's easy to look at it that way. But rather than that, it's the it, it when you look at all the facets that we've already touched on, it just makes it the 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 soundest form of money that's ever been created, and that's the point, right? So yeah, and which means the, the, you know the, the money that is the least if influenceable is that the word or like yeah, the least, that's least right. corruptible least, in a sense, least right? Corruptible. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and and that's the point. So when people start to understand that, it's not about the technology. It's not about number go up. It's not about just inflation. It's not about mm-hmm. just being able to, to hold on to. It's about it being actual store value and yeah. an actual form of money that is not is not corruptible. And when people start to understand that, but it's difficult. That is a very high bar for, for people to understand and get to. And so everybody has to do their own homework to understand it. Yeah. Why? I mean, why does the world use the U.S. dollar? Why? It's simple. They trust that I, I can take a U.S. dollar and bring it to Europe and 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 exchange it for goods and services there. I can take it to Thailand and and exchange it for goods and services in in Taiwan or in China or. Even in Russia, you can take a dollar and they want it. Why? Because yeah. it, it's the most it, it it's the most trustworthy money out there, currency yeah. out there, right? And so, Bitcoin doesn't have that yet. And actually, the dollar is also this is a whole other direction. I don't think we, we want to go there. But what I like about the energy analogy actually is that if you want to store your energy in a money shouldn't the money also be backed by energy right because so because then you can match it you know that's uh, right. al- almost as as like the calories or kilojoule or whatever so so can you can you match it in a sense and and also i think uh, or and i think the dollar is actually the only fiat currency that is somewhat <laughs> or was somewhat backed by energy right because it was connected to um to the oil, that that was kind of like the trick, right? How it became the world, uh, the world currency. Yeah. So in in that sense, yeah. it's interesting to see that people already pick the money currently with the most energetic potential or something, right? Like that it that that already is happening um, without them even understanding Bitcoin, obviously. But it's interesting to see that that is the human. Well, they knew it. They fabricated that, right? Yeah. And back in 1971, when uh, Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard for good 
and and had an agreement with Saudi Arabia to um, basically only transact in in U.S. dollars for for yeah. oil trade. That's when they they knew it. But in reality, going back to your uh, inflation um, comment, which is the two percent inflation, we know it's not two percent or three percent or four percent. We know it's not four percent. Go and do some grocery shopping and tell me that the grocery is only up four percent from last year. <laughs> yeah, search That's inflation lunacy. on TikTok. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. but they they also know that they can only get away with so much. They keep we have this thing now in media, which in, this is a whole nother problem where if if you say it, it's true until it's and until it's proven untrue. And and if you say it enough times, people just believe it, you know. And so that's one of the major problems that we have is that you've got mainstream media, you've got the White House and and both parties. This is not this is not Democratic or Republican. Both parties are complicit in this. The entire system is complicit in this where they just gaslight the American public. And Europe is doing the same thing as bad or if not worse, gaslighting the people about the reality of inflation, the reality of the of the money and just how much is it has expanded and just how badly this Cantown effect has taken place where the the whoever's closest to the spigot, the 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 faucet of money, whoever's the closest gets the biggest benefit. And of yeah. course, those are the large those are the large they're the politicians and large banks. That's the way it is. And but they don't want you to know that. So they hide that by telling you that inflation is lower than it really is. And yeah. they and so it is it's systematic to manipulate those numbers because it's what they believe they can get away with. Because they know that they can't say, well, you know what, in this nation, in this world now, we think that four or five percent inflation is OK because people will wake up and go, wait a minute, five percent inflation. You know, that means in, in 10 years, my my money's worth even less than 50 percent of what it, what it was. That's not fair. Mm. You know, and so they 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 know that they can't get away with that. And so that's why there's this big, you know, th this big, uh, I want to say it's a charade, but it is a bit of a charade in, in public about getting the inflation rate down. And we'll see. We'll see exactly what it settles out to be. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, because once the people know they would want their money, right? But but, but the money right. is not in the banks, but we'll get to that in a second, I think. <laughs> um and and also to you know why we think bitcoin is is the solution i think and i agree like the, the people should understand the problem first right and especially in western countries like i'm also from a western western country and i talked about this a lot already like th there's no problem we don't have a problem we have a very luxurious life and everything is there and we have a, a roof and food and water and kids go to school and you know we don't have 100% uh, or what was it 100% uh inflation in lebanon inflation. i think it was overnight one yeah, one night exactly. it just got yeah, it devalued in half right so we we don't have that we haven't had that in a very long time right so it's also it, it i think it also feels very far away for people right even if you have all the rationale and all the all the all the explainers it still feels like yeah that's that's what happens in you know for third tier countries or something but in the U.S. currently, and and you talk a lot about this, uh, about the debt spiral. Can you explain, in a bit more layman terms, like what that is and and why people should pay attention? And this, of course, also ties into like how a government gets its funding, um, what sure. the rates of those fundings, uh, what the, what the rate of that funding is, and how attractive it is for other countries to buy debt yeah. from from countries. Absolutely. So basically, in in a nutshell, very simply, uh, if the if if the United States will just look at the United States because it's supposedly the best one, okay? Yeah. If the United States was a company listed on the in, on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, we would call it a zombie company. Why? The reason is that it doesn't it doesn't generate enough income to cover its its interest burden on yeah. its debt. Yeah. It, and so 
think it through, like if, if we just break it apart and I'll use numbers for people to, to grab onto, but if you figure that the, the United States, if, if we're looking at what these are the actual estimates from, from uh, the Congressional Budget Office, if the, if the United States expects to take in $4.4 trillion this year, okay? But in income, also, right? What's that? In income. In income. But yeah. we also expect to spend six point one trillion dollars. So that so the income is revenues. It's 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 a taxes. It's taxes, tax revenues. Yeah. And so it's 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 taxes off of our productivity. That's what it is. But the problem is we have a, we have a lot of entitlements, and these entitlements are things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the social programs, unemployment, stuff like that. And uh, and those all add up to over four trillion dollars. So let's call it four point two trillion dollars. Then we've got a military expense because we're in war everywhere. So we've got eight hundred billion dollars of military expense. But the entitlements, that first layer, the entitlement layer, that's those are those are expenses that are mandatory. They're signed into legislation. Yeah. And in order to not pay them, you have to sign them out of the legislation. You have to remove them from the legislation. You have to have a new bill passed that does not include that. So those have to be paid. If we don't pay those, we default, basically. Because that first, that the, the taking it out of the legislation is never going to happen. It's never going right? to happen. Like that's a, that's a revolt. It's basically. political suicide. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I agree. So the, the military, that's not, it's not mandatory, but... In this country, it seems to be mandatory. Number one, number two, it, these are long-term contracts that with with defense contractors that yeah. they're they're, they're going to pay those. And then the third thing is interest expense. Okay, so military is eight hundred billion dollars. The interest expense, when you net it out between what we're paying on interest and what we're receiving back at the treasury, because they have internal uh, measures there, it's about seven hundred billion dollars of net interest expense. So now. Add up all of that, and then the other expenses, which come up to be about four hundred billion dollars, and add back the the accounting gimmick that they use because of the student loan debt mm -hmm. forgiveness of last year. They added back this year. Well, you actually get to about six point four trillion dollars of spending, which gives us a two trillion dollar deficit. That's two trillion dollars that we're spending over what we're taking in on tax revenue. So what, so what can we do? Well, you can either cut spending, which is austerity. We saw what happened with, with Greece, and, and we've seen Italy try to do that before. It does not work. Number one, it's political suicide. Nobody's going to do it here. Number two, you could, do, uh, you could raise your taxes. We hear this all the time, raise the taxes, raise the taxes. Well, that doesn't really work either because it ends up disincentivizing and disabling the ability for companies to add to productivity, do research, research and development, uh, build out production lines on certain products and services, hire more people. And so you, they wind up being less productive. And yeah. so even higher taxes on less productivity, you get to the same spot. It doesn't really the Same work. gap, right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And then the third thing you can do is just issue more debt. If you just borrow more, then you can borrow more. Pay then off, you can pay off, <laughs> yeah. pay off the, 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 that now let's remember you, you not only do you have that, that spending gap, but you also have bonds that are, that are maturing that you've got to pay for as well. So that like that, all that ends up, you have to issue more debt. It's the easiest thing to do. You just borrow more, you raise the debt ceiling, you raise the debt ceiling, you raise the debt ceiling, you just keep borrowing more, borrowing more, borrowing more. And so you, and, but the issue there is, Brown, when you get, especially when you get into situations now where we printed a lot of money during the, the COVID downturn and we flooded the, the banks and the system with 5.5, almost $6 trillion worth of, of, of extra money, well, then we have inflation. Well, then we have to raise interest rates to battle that inflation. So as the, as the, the central bank, as the Fed raises interest rates, what does that do? Well, the treasury is out there issuing bonds. Now they're issuing bonds at a higher interest rate than they were just two years ago. And so yeah. as these bonds mature and they have to issue bonds at a higher interest rate, well, now their interest expense goes up. So the interest expense last year was under a trillion dollars. And now 
it's it, it was it was maybe three hundred billion dollars um, net, three hundred fifty. Now it's about seven hundred billion dollars net. So like the the analogy there is, of course, if you have a credit card, you take another credit card, pay off the other, and you go on and on and on. You're basically the the subject of your own Ponzi in a in a sense, right? Yeah, that's right. So if you're yeah, if you're a yeah. Yeah, if you're a single parent and you're trying to make it through and you've got your your mandatory expenses of your mortgage and your car payment and your you've got to pay for gas and food, you've got kids, you got to put clothes on their back. And so those are mandatory. And yeah. if you're if you're if you're not able to make enough money to pay for all that, you have to you you do whatever you do, you you can do, you take out a credit card. Then yeah. you wind up you, know, you you wind up filling up that credit card, maxing it out, and then you have to take out another credit card, and then you max yeah. it, you take out another card. And the interest expense gets so big that now all of your income is going towards the interest yeah. expense, and you're in this debt spiral. And that's where we are. We're mathematically yeah. there in the United States where our debt has gone up from $31.5 trillion last year to $33.7 trillion. Actually, it's only it's it's in just a few months. In like five months, it's gone up over $2.2 trillion, $2.3 trillion wow. in just four or five months. So Unfathomable uh, amounts, right? Like how... It's unfathomable yeah. how much that is. So wow. people say, yeah, yeah, but our GDP is going up. Well, yes, our GDP is going up because of inflation. Our tax revenue is not going. This is a good point. Sorry to interrupt, but it's a good point, right? Because in the beginning yeah. we said prices and value and stuff. So, so the GDP goes up in the numbers you see, but if all the numbers go up, then that's you know, right. And the gap doesn't really still, matter, right? This, the gap is still growing. The debt is mm. still growing faster than than our GDP yeah. and tax revenue. And so the issue there is that as it grows more and more, it's unsustainable. I don't know when it breaks. Not tomorrow. Not next year, not the year after, but it eventually is just gets to, the debt burden gets to be too big. And so going back to what we talked about at the beginning of our conversation was then people start to lose confidence in the dollar at yeah. some point. I'm not saying that's happening today or tomorrow because the dollar is still going to swallow other currencies. We're watching it happen last night. Uh, you know, you had you had a, uh, a Argentina. Um, yeah, in Argentina, you had a populist um, win Argent the Argentinian election and now is saying that he wants to abolish the central bank and uh, and fix their finances and, and go on the U.S. dollar um, as their as their currency, uh, as their reserve currency. Well, the issue there is it's going to be very painful for them. But the dollar that basically just swallowed Argentina then. And this yeah. is going to this is going to happen over and over and over again. And so, and so the dollar will con continue to 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 exist. But yeah. you can see how this game is just going to continue. Okay, yeah. yeah. And, and, but so this is, is uh, I think, two things. Like he wants the dollar because it's less worse than the Argentinian peso, right? Yeah. I also read something about you know this is a different conversation, but how about you can he he could dollarize before he de-dollarizes again or something like that, right? Just to fill or or make sure that the 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 damage of the peso uh, the argentinian peso is not you know going to be more exactly. and what you just said about the debt spiral right it's like you want to have more debt so you can stay afloat basically but there's two things i think if we go back to the analogy of the credit card you slowly see that not everyone wants to give you a credit card anymore right or it becomes harder to get a credit card so you need exactly. different different rates right to actually get a new credit card to pay off the old stuff but also what you mentioned is if i don't know like the the points on the credit card would be a currency then there's also people who don't want to pay with that currency anymore, right? So there's basically two two problems where in Argentina, well, they would want the dollar because the peso is way, way, way worse. But in a BRICS area, uh, I just read something about, I think, uh, China and Saudi Arabia or something like they're going to exchange trade, which is not in the dollar. So they are, so the dollar is being ditched in some places as the tradable currency, but there's also <clears throat> less um, trust in the paying off of yeah. the debt. Right? And the reason for that is that we look, this is all geopolitical stuff. And so there BRICS knows they're not going to create a currency tomorrow that rivals the dollar. That's not the point. They just want to minimize the amount of treasuries they have to own 
while they yeah. while when they have to make cross border, border trade. So if they don't have to do their non energy trade in dollars, that helps them because they don't have to go buy U.S. Treasuries. And why do they not want to buy Treasuries? They're looking at our our balance sheet growing, and they're seeing this the 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 amount of debt that's just expanding so rapidly that they don't they don't want to be sitting on something they know so going back to the the debt spiral there's the fourth option after you issue more debt what do you do you introduce inflation you allow inflation you actually want to you you, you want to have inflation you want to create inflation because then you create those nominal dollars, like you just the said. Numbers, it's fake, yeah. It's fake GDP. Yeah. The GDP yeah. goes up, but it's fake. It's in dollars that are worth way less than when you mm-hmm. issued that debt. So this is what we saw happen out in Greece, right? So eventually, the the people who own Greek debt, they 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 when they when Greece wanted to issue more debt, it was at a higher interest rate, and then a higher interest rate, and a higher interest rate because people just stopped trusting it. And so eventually they had to, you know, they had to have an austerity program. They had to reset and it was ugly. Uh, And so people lost life savings. Banks took money from them out of their deposits. They just seized their deposits. And it was, so it was, it was ugly. And those are the things that happened. And so, but that, and that is the ultimately the issue exactly where the confidence is lost when that happens. In the United States, again, I don't know, but it is that is a big red flag of what you just mentioned, that the BRICS nations are trying to trade with each other. And and I, I, I think what I saw, and I haven't read the article yet, it's been a busy day, but I think what I saw was that they're doing about a $6 billion transaction mm-hmm. in That's non-energy what I mean. goods, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that makes sense. Saudi Arabia is not going to cause an uproar doing, you know, uh, oil trades and agree to do oil trades uh, in in non U.S. dollar. That that would be it would it would cause a lot of tension. But uh, doing minimizing the amount of of treasuries they have to hold makes sense. There's another reason for it. I mean, when you're when you're a non uh, ally, close ally of the United States. And you hold treasuries, you're not sure if we don't just seize those or stop you being able to make payments on on the SWIFT yeah. network because we decide that, well, you've done something we don't agree with. And of course, in, invading Ukraine and killing people, that's that's awful. There's no there's no way to to frame that positively. But when you have this a central bank says that we're going to freeze your assets, then it it Unfortunately, in game theory, it makes countries who are not our close allies yeah, think, they don't twice, want to play. <laughs> think yeah. twice about accumulating yeah. treasuries, which is quite quite the reason that China is not out there accumulating treasuries anymore. It's a big reason for that. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of where we're at. But <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's very big. <laughs> It's, it's a very big, and that's, so yeah. you go from this little thing of Bitcoin to you <laughs> yeah. understand like wow yeah. this the system is really is is perverse it's damaged it's manipulated and it benefits just a few people at the top and it's and it's a it's all about control and and, and w- yeah would you say it also became worse after America went off this gold standard because also gold, right, is made through energy in the ground by the, the nature's forces, right? So in some way... Um, and you've got to go spend money to go mine it and get it out. Yeah, Exactly. So the, the proof of work in a sense, right? Exactly. Like, is, is this where we are now? Is this the result of that? Or is that too 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 simple to say that? Oh, so where the introduction we are now, of the absolutely. fiat money. It's absolutely the it's it's caused by the 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 US coming off the gold standard and allowing the central bank to manipulate the currency the way it has. We shouldn't have such drastic uh recessions and expansions. Um but we do because of the manipulation of interest rates and, and availability of capital. And yeah. so and so as we continue to have that, it only gets worse and worse. And you see these contractions and expansions, they, they get almost violent. And so um, 
Absolutely. And that's, yeah. and that's kind of where we're at. So when, when you look at Bitcoin, my belief is that Bitcoin first becomes like digital gold. That's the first step. We, it doesn't go to the step of, okay, now it's the reserve asset. The the money. It's, yeah. it's perfect money. It's, it's got multiple layers and the lightning. That, it, it, it doesn't just happen overnight. The first thing that has to happen is for people to broadly understand it in the investment community, not just on the ground in places where they're trying to protect their money, like the, the countries that we've listed, the, the small, the, the Lebanons and the Venezuelas. And, and you know, the, once, once you get to the point where, in my belief, is that once you get to the point where you have broad, uh, in, broad understanding in institutions all the way down to individuals, that's where it becomes digital gold. And that's the major first step. And when it has enough, it has enough value in it, the, the, the market value of Bitcoin, of the network, it has enough money in it to, to dampen that volatility. That's when it becomes a true store of value. And then it, then it can really grow from there. Yeah. Before we talk about that further, I had one, one question to ask you about like the current situation. Also, one of the things why I actually moved more of what I had into Bitcoin. You, you, um, I saw an article of you that talked about um, how the bank deposits are decreasing. And uh, one of the topics I talk a lot about with people is that the money in the bank is not yours. That's what I learned when I was 30 and had a mortgage and was working at a bank, actually. <laughs> and a colleague told me and explained to me how, how the fractional reserve banking works, right? right? And so the money in the bank is not even yours. If you have money in the bank and you believe that they have it, it's probably not even there, which is even crazier, <laughs> I'd say. Right. And I saw your article and I wanted to ask you, why are the bank deposits decreasing and what does it mean for, you know, uh, this podcast is geared toward my, my millennial peers, you know, who want to invest and uh, mm -hmm. save. H how does this impact them? And also then perhaps like, how does it correlate to what we just talked about with the uh, debt spiral, if any? Yeah, the recent drawdown in, in uh, bank deposits is pretty simple. People are taking money out of the bank and they're putting them in, into uh, money markets and CDs where they're invested in, in money, in, in treasuries, basically, or T-bills. Mm. And so they're, they come out of there, they go into investment accounts that, that, are, that are generating an, an interest. Why are they doing that? Well, because the banks are being piggy and they're refusing to uh, to raise the interest rate on deposits. So remember, the banks borrow from the short end and lend on the long end of the curve. And yeah. so what we have seen is that the long end of the curve has been lower than the short end, but the banks have been refusing to move the deposit rates up in line with Fed funds. So, it used so that's to be, the interest that consumers get, you mean? Yeah, right? exactly. So you put money in a bank and you, you get your paycheck. You, you loan it you, to the bank. You, you, <laughs> right. you loan it to the bank. You put it, you put it, it gets deposited into the bank. You don't even get to see it. Your, your company sends it to the bank and mm -hmm. it gets upon the, deposited in the bank. And, uh, you know, let's say it's $10,000. Well, there's a few things that go on here. First of all, assume that's $10,000 after taxes. If you get that paycheck, it goes in. There's ten thousand dollars after taxes. If you want that money, well, you the bank has to notify the government that you took your ten thousand dollars from the bank. Okay, that's that you earned with your risk taking you and earned, energy expenditure. They, they, <laughs> they have a clear. They have a clear. You know, line. Show yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Of transaction and. You want that money. They have to first. They have to tell the U.S. government that why, and then they'll ask you a bunch of like, why do you need this money? What are you doing with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so that's that. And then the second thing is um, that money goes in there, and you're you should be making an interest on that because you're loaning it to the bank. You're loaning that money to the bank, and they're going to use it for their purposes. Yeah. So, but they're paying Make you more money, right? Exactly. Yeah. They're not even paying yeah. you like half a percent on that. Like 0.2% like, or something on, on those, like it's, it's abysmal. It's, it's almost criminal. And so if you're not understanding that and you just have money sitting in the bank and you don't think about this, you're being robbed and you yeah. don't even realize it. So, but people are waking up 
I think this is the biggest thing people need to understand now. Like the the this I am two ways. They don't want their money in the bank because they saw what happened in Silicon Valley. So you saw Bitcoin uh, really rise in value when Silicon Valley Bank went under, and there was a lot of talk of other banks going under. So you saw Bitcoin go up, and people were taking money out of the bank and putting it in Bitcoin. Yeah, and saying well, I don't care if it's volatile. At least I know that. That's also it's how I view it. Moving the wealth, not you're not buying Bitcoin. You're taking what you own from system you're storing A storing it elsewhere to system B. Yes, exactly. You're yeah. Storing it elsewhere, and yes, it's volatile to get in and out, but at least it's yeah. not going to zero, in my belief. Yeah, and then the second thing is the the deposits are being drawn down with people who want to stay in the traditional system, and being moved into into treasuries via the money market yeah. accounts. Yeah, and so that's why the U.S. Treasury is borrowing on the on the short end of the curve. They're borrowing and borrowing and borrowing using T bills. They're they're auctioning off T bills because they can use that money for T bills basically in the money markets. Yeah, and so. Yeah, yeah, this topic I'm very adamant about it. Like this specific part because I try to not talk about Bitcoin then, but just share this exact part, what we just talked about, right? Like mm-hmm. the money in a bank is not yours. If you want what you think you own, they will ask you questions like, what do you think about that? Yeah. You know, and I've talked to friends, I also said this a few times here on the podcast, like I, I have some friends who have a lot of money. They are not Bitcoiners and they don't see a problem that, I don't know if they want to take 100k cash from the bank. I I had that as an example, right? And I said, like, well, if you would want to do that, like, do you think you would get it? And then my friend said, well, maybe I have to wait two days, but that's it's more like a nuisance or something. And it's just so like he's very smart, and I admire him, (laughs) you know. And it's just he just sees it as a nuisance. And then I just kind of say, like, well, if you see it as a nuisance, then there's not much else we can talk about, right? Like for me, it's kind of like the first step of the of the bigger problem that you actually experience, experience and see that a third party has control over that what you earned. That's right. And that- You've yeah, conceded this, control of that. That's exactly. right. Exactly, yeah. So you're not a sovereign individual anymore and, and, and right. all these things. And that doesn't even talk about Bitcoin. That's just trying to understand like how the current system uh, works. But again, you know, if, on paper, you see it, and if you want to send me 100k, you can do it. You, you will, by the way, still get a call probably. Why are you doing that? Oh, you yeah. know, so it still works. Like it's not really, it's not really broken in that sense for them. So I, I find that like an interesting like topic to to start talking about and see, you know, how that resonates with with people. So if we talked about this, how do we transition to Bitcoin? Like, how does Bitcoin offer a solution for how that current system works? Well, long, long, long term, it offers a, uh, a reserve asset that currencies can be pegged against and yeah. can be can be transferred for. Uh, so you can redeem your your money certificates for that for Bitcoin rather than just another currency. And so uh, that's I love the, that that's, you said money certificate, <laughs> and that's the point, right? So yeah. that's it. You can it's that certificate. You can take it and say, "I want my, I want Bitcoin." Yeah, and they, you know, and so, um, and that's and that's really the that's the ultimate. Uh, I think that's the ultimate end game where it becomes Bitcoin becomes the global reserve asset, and uh, it, can, it 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 won't be gold. Gold is is too difficult to transfer. It's too difficult to audit. It's too difficult to trust that uh, that uh, you know a, a bank, a central bank, has the right amount of gold in its vaults. That it's not counterfeit. It's just hard. Whereas Bitcoin, you can see the transactions, the the addresses. You can see everything in the wallets, um, and you'd know. And so that that makes it ultimately the the I I believe in the future, the global reserve asset. When we get there, it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a very long time. I don't think we get there in 10 years or 15 years. It's going to be decades, but you may see it. You know, um, I may fun. see it. I may <laughs> see it. Yeah. it. It's possible. Um, but uh, but between now and then, I still do believe that that's the, the ultimate, the, the, the ultimate uh, next step is going to be the, the digital gold step. And people believing yeah. in it. But once you have that belief, 
then then uh, it can it can start expanding and yeah. and becoming much more than than just that. Well, the step to trading um, trading it as a money will be way smaller, I think. Like if people uh, start to view it as I'm not storing my wealth in system A, but I'm storing it in in this new system that is right. provably more yeah easier to use more transparent ultimately transparent i would say 24 7 365 auditable all all these things that this other system is not right permissionless what we just talked about right where someone else asks you uh, why are you going to use this money that's it right. just I, do you still find it difficult like i find it difficult in some sense like i see all these things but i still want to teach it and share it with other other people and still challenge myself to like okay how do i word this like how do i say this how do i explain it so that i can kind of like retrace my own steps and hopefully touch someone at some point right where they start pulling that thread on whatever they whatever dimension they run into like how how's that for you you are in education you have your newsletter and company mm -hmm. like what what's your biggest challenge there well, I, for me, uh, I like like I said, I always start with the money, and just they can't understand. You can't understand Bitcoin if you don't understand the money and how it's broken. And so, for me, when we sit around and talk about the things that could be fixed with Bitcoin, that that helps. Um, and so, those are that's that's really what it comes down to for me. And when you know teaching my kids how the system is 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 not working for them and how it's working for some other people that that really opens their, their mind up to understanding oh okay i understand so the fiat system is for the those old people in charge and the and bitcoin is really for the next generation and that's yeah. and that's and that's kind of the way that i frame it and that's it's for the next generation of, of wealth uh, if you view it like that and you teach your kids then i think you're definitely going to see it in your lifetime and i mean like they are going to work for fiat and they're going to save in bitcoin that's right if you taught them the right way right so that's right i think you will definitely see it and i, I think that's actually great you know to go back to what we talked about with the different generations like your generation has um the insights to already educate their children right and so your your generation's children will start that that wave i think of saving in in another system which yeah, is yeah, first time and, I thought about that. Actually, very cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah since I'm Gen X, my generation is, is like we didn't we don't have the benefits uh, that the boomers got from the fiat system. So yeah, we do understand how it's broken, and we're tr we're trying, we're scrambling to make sure that we retain our savings and and protect our wealth uh, because it's not so much that that we can just sit on it and spend it until we die like the boomers but yeah um we understand <laughs> yeah. that we're not going to have social security we're not going to have the, that safety net and the, those benefits we're, we're going to have to really figure out a way to save it. and so it means it, it it means something to us it yeah. it really means something to us and so we're the first generation for it to, to to need it and yeah. then we're teaching the millennials who need it desperately and we're teaching our kids the gen z's that Okay, you guys really need to understand how the money's broken and where 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 the future is. So. Yeah, love that. All right, to end this conversation, the last question that I ask everyone: What's a core belief that you will never let go? My core belief that I will never let go. Truly, it's that you can achieve anything you set your mind to, and awesome. uh, that's. You know, I, I, I've always believed that. And, uh, and though I have not achieved everything that I, that I have set my goals on, I've gotten way further than I ever thought I would. And so anybody who wants to do something, just if you put your mind to it and you do the work, you can get there. Awesome. Love that. Well, thanks so much for this conversation. Thanks again for coming on. 
and um, I will link to everything you do and your social accounts uh, in the in the show notes, so people can uh, learn awesome. more from you, just like as I learned a lot from you. Um, yeah, so thanks again, awesome. and uh, hope to stay in touch. Yeah, thank you so much, Brahma. It's great to be here, and I uh, look forward to our next conversation. Cheers. Likewise. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.